with uh, the passing of the Queen this year, truly a, a chapter in British philately has closed. And I had put this together earlier this year for presentation at IPEX up in Portland, and I have expanded it a bit for this meeting. This is a high-level presentation on the, the philatelic changes that have occurred during the Queen's reign, which was obviously very, very long. And her reign is important to philately because it is the point at which the British finally really got automation right. And to do that, it is intensely focused on the stamps. So the stamps go from being little colored pieces of paper with gum on the back and you pay a tax, essentially, to an interactive device. And it involves the paper, the coatings, the phosphorescent and fluorescent materials that were used. So I'll cover that here. And I intend to do it without any commemoratives, just through the definitives uh, here. And I'm going to switch back here after a couple of slides to a previous presentation to catch up on a little history of why all these changes were required. To begin with, obviously, uh, everyone knows that the penny black was the first stamp uh, from Queen Victoria. And the stamps moved through various reigns of King Edward VII and uh, George V. When Edward VIII came along briefly, the stamp design that he had was uh, very simplistic. It was actually designed by a kid who submitted it and won the competition, and they realized it was a kid, but he really liked that. There is a similarity between Edward VIII and the Penny Black. Now, the Penny Black does have a background that is engine-turned, a lot of curves and, and whatever, but beyond that, it's quite a simple stamp. One of the things that I point out here in the beginning on the Penny Black, the engravers put in check letters in the lower corners, and these were designed, and they start with row A through T and columns A through L. So it was a 200 stamp pane. I bring this up because right from the beginning, there was a fear of counterfeiting. And this was an attempt to make the plate so complex to uh, print that counterfeiters would not uh, attempt it. Later on in the development, they would put letters in the upper end up here. So if you hear the term uh, penny black stars or penny red stars, these are the stars up here. And later on, there will be more check letters. I only bring it up because of this counterfeiting issue. What they managed to do was keep counterfeiters from really doing this, but what it didn't stop was a lot of forgeries to fool collectors. And we'll talk about that a bit later. The designs were complex, as you can see, until you get to some simplicity here. And finally, George VI uh, went back to the complex design. There were a number of initial photographs when the Queen ascended uh, to the throne in 1952, and the best known uh, are probably the Wilding photos, and I'll be showing the Wilding definitives here. But the one I always, I, I also really liked a lot was always the Anagoni photo. I just thought it was a, a good shot. At this point in time, the early Queen Elizabeth stamps really were like all the other stamps. They consisted of a layer of, of paper with gum underneath and an image on top, and they had various watermarks. So if you collect in this era, there are inverted watermarks and sideways watermarks and what have you, and it just depended on how the, the sheet got inserted uh, into the press. The first releases in, in 1952 looked like this. I always thought that the coloration of the stamps of, of this period is really, really attractive. And if you have several pages of this with the different watermarks and, and what have you, it makes a really nice definitive collection. Photogravure was used. Some of the prior stamps were either photogravure or surface print uh, with British, but they finally settled on uh, photogravure. 
which is a nine step process. If you've ever gone through it, it's really complex and I personally can't believe it even works, <laughs> but it does. Uh, it's an acid etch process. The Castles stamps were also issued just a bit later, and these have been a long-running series. If you collect the Castles, there's all kinds of variations and varieties. It's just a wonderful place to pick up, especially some of the higher values. Waterloo and Delarue and Bradbury Wilkinson were all involved in the printings, and I think it's I can't remember which one is it the water low printing that's moderately expensive. Most of them are fairly <laughs> achievable, although the varieties can get extremely expensive. A little bit later on, there was quite a move in the UK to have regional stamps. And they're denoted by the region, and today it's called country, but it would have the symbols up here. So you had dragons and lions and all kinds of things. Again, there's lots of varieties, and as you can see up here, you've got different watermarks and, and what have you to take a look at. The initial regions were Scotland, Wales, Monmouthshire, Northern Ireland, and Isle of Man. That'll mutate over the years into Scotland, Wales, England, and Northern Ireland. They dropped Isle of Man shortly after the Machins came on. With rising demand, the post in the UK was running into the millions. It became necessary to really have automated equipment. And the only way to do that was to be able to find the front of the envelope and to find where the stamp was. Well, happily, it just developed as a convention that the stamp went in the upper right-hand corner and a return address in the upper left-hand corner. So there were a number of experiments that got started at this time to try and find a way to find the stamp. And I want to go back to a bit of history. If we go back to the beginning of the last century, this is how a post office looked. And what you can see here are tables of mail that have just been brought in and dumped. And you would have rows of people that had cubicles here with 48 sort boxes a piece, and mail would just get delivered to them, and they would pass it down if it didn't happen to be an area that their little cubicle covered. So the UK was divided up into all these little areas. And if you notice, all of these people are men. So this is really how the post was operating. And if you look at trying to think through how in the world you would automate this, you've really got to consider a whole bunch of things. You've got to sort the letters. You've got to find the front of the letter. You've got to face it. You've got to choose the service class. And in the UK, back at that time, there was the paper rate and the letter rate. Those would become second class and first class a bit later on. So you had a class to decide you had canceling to decide, and you needed some kind of postcode development. Well, early on in London and Edinburgh and a couple of the other larger cities, a compass code had been created. So you might have London SW1, which is Southwest Region 1 in the Southwest. 10 Downing Street is at London SW1. But so what? I mean, you're still hand sorting that and hand reading it. I don't expect anybody remotely <laughs> to read this, but this is the development of the postcode of letter facing and sorting and stamp identity and the key events that had to occur for automation to happen. And if you look back here, starting in 1952, right around here, this is why Queen Elizabeth's reign is so important, because all of this stuff had to happen during her reign for automated sorting to occur. You've got an issue of local collection. It comes into a post office. It may get delivered back locally, or it may go to a new post office where it then gets delivered locally. So you've got an inbound and an outbound sorting problem on top of everything else. And 
of course, mail carriers would just pick this stuff up and they'd just come and dump the bag, literally, onto the table. As this began to be recognized early on, as early as 1899, a fellow named General Williamson, who had run the post office for the Army, had been asked to come in and take a look at how do we start to automate this. And, of course, World War I was a big factor in this because all of the men were being called away. And as you recall from my earlier comments, women couldn't possibly be allowed to operate any kind of machinery or anything. So the U.K. actually tried on two occasions to build a machine back in this period that could letter face and sort mail. Both of those efforts failed. One of them just frankly didn't work. Another one that was horizontal based using gravity actually worked, but it was so big. And because it was horizontal, you couldn't get under it to make repairs when a motor or something would break down. So they ended up throwing that out. But then the Dutch come along and the Dutch had created something called the Transorma, which was transport and sorting. And the last two letters, M and A, were the inventors of it, Marchand and Andresen. And so it went into operation in the Netherlands in 1927, and Williamson went to look at it and decided, not only do I like it, but it's also the only option that we possibly have. He came back, by the way, and told everything to this company, Jackson and Company, that he'd seen to see if they could build a knockoff, which totally failed. The machines were ordered, and they were delivered in 1935. And prior to that, there was a substantial amount of training with a keyboard. And you can see the keyboard down here or a facsimile of it down here. And what the transformer would do, and I'll show you a picture of it in a moment, it was completely mechanical, except for the motor that drove a, a belt that went in a large oval. And... These folks here were required to memorize 254 codes, depending on where a letter was supposed to go in the UK. So it's humans as software. Memorizing those codes and, and whatever was, was very important. Now, what they did, and, and here's the machine. It's, it's a two-level machine. So up here and way in the back, these people are seated you can see crib sheets for the codes up here that they had to remember. And as they would punch in a code with their left hand, you can see his hand on the little keyboard here. It would set the pins in this so that this thing then knew where to drop the letter into the storage bins, which are all along the bottom. That's how this got sorted. And each operator got what was called an ident. It's, it's an identification pin here that has a letter or a number on the side. And as a letter would be drop it into a slot, there was a, a mechanism that marked his identification on the envelope. Now, these became actually quite collectible. It's probably fallen off today, although there is a mechanization mm -hmm. society in the UK that's alive and well. And the purpose of this was if you miscoded it and it went to the wrong place, they knew who did it. Yeah. So they come back to you, you know, and smack you about the head and shoulders, I, I presume. Where did it put it on the end? Right on the front. Right on the front. So you'd have a D or an A or a 1 or something like that, usually in red, and it was quite visible. And so they became very collectible because there are some very rare ones that, that hardly ever got used. So this was the late 30s, early 40s? No, 1935. This machine actually ran to 1962, Ooh, wow. if you can believe that. Wow. Unfortunately, it was completely taken down and scrapped. The British uh, archives didn't exist at the time. So, mm -hmm. again, only men can do this, right? Do they have only one machine? They had two, and they were delivered to Brighton. And mm -hmm. the reason was that the manager at Brighton was a relatively young person, and they thought that having a young person, he would be less inclined to resist using this thing. And they also had room 
for plenty of sorting tables at the Brighton Post Office at that time in case this thing blew up and they had to go back and do hand sorting. Mm -hmm. Now this is, you know, this is pre-World War II. A couple of movies were made and, and here I have to thank not only the uh, British uh, archives, but also the Dutch Institute of Vision and Speech. This is the English version of the Transformer. Now, you see boxes of mail going up. You see all this stuff packed down mm -hmm. here and whatever. It goes up unsorted in a carrying case and it comes over here and these people are orienting. They're doing the facing. They're pulling them out and making sure. And these guys here, you can see him working the keyboard down here all mechanical, and you see the speed at which he was working. The Dutch version. These <laughs> appear to be women. Uh, speed yeah. up. <laughs> okay. There's the keyboard, and look at the speed this young lady is working. I mean, I don't know if this is women's liberation or <laughs> continuation of slavery, <laughs> but this is how this thing worked. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, for this movie, they were working rapidly, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. you can see the volume of mail and the speed at which that something like this had to operate. The first attempt at, at trying to find the stamp was to put graphite bars on the front. Actually, they tried a, a, a zinc compound earlier. George VI and Queen Elizabeth II did not like having big black, ugly bars on the front of their stamps. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this was that graphite is conductive. And so what you would do is the machine would take a letter in and from either side, it would put forward two electrical prongs to try and make an electrical connection. So you got four corners over here and you got four corners on the back, whichever one of those actually got a connection that indicated where the stamp was. So the machine would then know how to either rotate, flip, or, or reverse to get the letter faced. Well, there were a couple of problems with this. One, it ran at high voltage at around 240 volts. So you run the risk of your operators getting zapped. And the other problem with it was that on a wet day in England, and there aren't very many of those in course, the whole envelope was conducted. <laughs> so it worked from time to time. They tried this experiment in a couple of locations. And what they ended up doing, of course, because of the visual problem here, was they put the graphite bands on the back. This made the process even worse because you had to try and make the connection through the front of the stamp, but you've got ink, paper, gum, and then the bands. The bands are very collectible. And this is also the origin of, this is very British. If you have one band, that's second class. If you have two bands, that's first class. Did any of these get onto actual envelopes that made it through oh, the mail? Yeah. Oh. Yes, they have, and they are very collectible. I, I have actually a, a whole exhibit, an eight frame exhibit on this with these bands, and it'll be up at RMSS this okay. year. The graphite is called deflocculated graphite, mm -hmm. which sounds moderately obscene to yes. me, but deflocculated means that lumps and clumps are all dispersed. So they tried that, and this mentions the electrical connections or whatever. The whole thing just didn't work. Dallas Hill, a city outside of London, where there was a very large research facility there and the post office was a big piece of this. So the Dallas Hill research people got to working to figure out how to do this with phosphorescent compounds applied to the, the stamps. So now the first thing, so what's phosphorescence? Well, you know, if you go to a rock show and they'll, they'll turn on a UV lamp and you see the rocks glow and then they turn the lamp off and instantly the glow is gone. That's fluorescence. That doesn't have an afterglow. Phosphorescence does, and it's a quantum mechanical effect that electrons 
falling from one state to another, it takes a little bit of time for that fall to happen. And, and when that happens, it creates an afterglow. It can be very brief, but it's long enough to be able to see it with a sensor. So you flash it, the envelope moves along, sensor reads what it just saw. Did I just see one band or two bands? And it knows now what service class to put it in. The automatic letter facing machine was developed at Dallas Hill and it was the first British very successful machine. Dallas Hill also was very involved in the post office savings program, and they also worked very closely with people like Alan Turing to develop the Colossus after World War II to follow on from Turing's machine that broke the Enigma code. But the British just couldn't keep up. The Americans and other people just had too much money, and so computer research ended. This is what happens as the letter's headed through this way. You get an illuminator. And you can see, uh, you, you can then see with a sensor down here, uh, how many bands I've got. Is this a first or second class? And it doesn't actually count the bands. After 66 millimeters, it stops. And if it's seen one in that point in time, it was second class. And if it saw more than one, it was first class and it doesn't care about any other bands. So when you see British envelopes coming in, they got all these stamps all over them. The sorting machine doesn't care. It just wants to know, what did I see in the beginning? Now, at the same time, this sorting issue was attacked by the folks at uh, Dallas Hill, and a primitive barcode was developed, a very early barcode system, so it was digital. And this phosphorescence uh, was called PHD, and a second one called CSA. And the difference in these phosphorescences are that they produce an afterglow in a certain color range, and sensors could pick that up. Well, this was much more of a purplish violet color. This was much more of a bluish color. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. um, on any given day, the phosphorescence from this would mingle with this, and the machine <coughs> would begin to reject either the, the, the sorting or the, the stamp. So what could go wrong? Well, um, it was common with stitch booklets uh, in the UK to put advertising either as advertising pages or on a blank spot of the stamp. Well, guess what? Now I've got phosphor on this little advertisement, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know how they finally figured it out, but somebody noticed that advertisements were going through completely valid as stamps. I mean, it's a <laughs> first-class stamp. <laughs> this set off something called the blind panes, which still exists today. But what they did was they started removing these perforations here. If you're familiar with cylinders on a press, they're just a rotation of the image. Well, you have the color image, a cylinder, that has the image of the queen and the denomination and all. And you have a second cylinder that puts on the phosphor ink. It's just ink, but it, but it has a phosphorescent compound. There is no phosphor, by the way, in phosphorescent ink. It's just a term meaning afterglow. So they started removing these and they went through all kinds of stages of this. It makes a nice little mini collection of, of how to get around this. And the whole time they said, well, we don't want blind people confusing you know, a label for a stamp. Now, they could have thought of this back in Edward VII, where they still had the same kind of booklets, but now suddenly the blind people are important. The other problem was that you had to synchronize the color cylinder and the phosphor cylinder so that it applied appropriately. You can't see the phosphor because it's relatively clear. So if you have a stoppage of the press, for example, and the two cylinders end up getting out of sync, you start printing things like this, where you have a whole group of stamps here with no phosphor on it. You have these stamps here and some spurious things. And then there's something called a doctor blade on the press, which cleans the ink off uh, every time the cylinder rotates. 
And if it gets screwed up, then you start getting smudges and things like that. It's like when your windshield wipers don't work. So now we've got uh, all these collectible varieties of these things of stamps, missing phosphor, extra bands, bands where they're not supposed to be advertising labels that, by the way, if you ever see it, I've searched for an envelope. I know they exist that still have uh, these things on them that had gone through. Mm -hmm. There's, I don't know, there's a, a, perhaps a dozen or so. Mm -hmm. If you ever see them at auction, please let me know. Okay, mm -hmm. so they tried this out to begin with, and they took all the graphite stamps that didn't work and turned them over, and they put what they had developed as the beginning here, the parahydroxydiphenyl phosphor, and it became known as green phosphor. And this is where, if you're a collector on this, you really want to know what you've got. This is where your family or significant other people think you're nuts, because the way to do this is to sit in your bathroom, irradiate this with a UV lamp with the light in the bathroom off, and then quickly Turn the light on, turn this lamp off, and see what color it is. <laughs> Your family hears a closed bathroom. You're going, like, oh, yeah. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, a like, regular loop with UV light would not turn on color? You can't see the color under the lamp. You have to irradiate it. It makes everything look purple, yeah. the whole stamp. So, they tried this, and, and so now you've got these layers of the stamp, and varieties are produced when any one of these layers gets messed up. I will tell you at this point that there are well over 7,000 varieties of the Machen stamp. So anyway, you can see how this starts to become the interactive device. It's no longer just a taxation to carry the mail. And the problem with this was that PhD is also susceptible to humidity and moisture, much less so than the graphite, but it still was problematic. So the development of this ended up really being from uh, Edward VIII back here, or even the beginning of the wildings, to the, the compound structure of the wildings, and finally to the final wildings and machins, mm -hmm. where you now have a much more stable, the terephthalic acid, uh, TPA, down here. And that provides the, the purplish uh, afterglow. So to give you some idea of how this actually looks, if you look at the afterglow, with the original formulation that was come up with, and it was patented in the UK by the chief engineer, Charles Forster at Dallas Hill, he and his team developed this thing called Amino G, and they labeled it as Letalite Y over here. I'm not sure how the name Letalite came to be, but its central emission is in the yellow phase. It compared well with zinc sulfide, which <laughs> is an inorganic compound, and all of these are organic. And rather than use this for two reasons, it was relatively expensive. It was used on the back of uh, initial radar screens, a yellowish color. But it also being a non-organic compound, it was granular try as you might, it was still granular, and they felt that all the perforation pins would be worn out punching through this, which actually turned out to be true. Well, this was very toxic. So the post office rightly said, okay, yeah, we can't really use that. They next developed this PhD, the parahydroxydiphenyl, in a cyuranic acid formaldehyde resin. And this became the, the workhorse for the, the little barcode for sorting is uh, carbazole 3 sulfonic acid, also in a cyuranic acid formaldehyde resin. And it principally irradiated in the blue range down here. And finally, the terephthalic acid, the, the purplish down here, uh, became the workhorse uh, for many, many years. The paper itself started out simple. It all came from Stowbridge Mill in the city of Ivy Bridge. And the mill is next to the Urm River. And from time to time, when you had a storm, since they just sucked water out of the Urm River, you'd get a very brownish color of paper out here. Finally, the post office said, because the paper was going from brilliant white to, to really, really brown, the post office said, all right, fix this. So, a layer of china clay 
was placed on the surface of the paper. And the first use of it is in the holiday booklets series. And you can see the difference in whiteness. This is a China clay on here. It's very common in British catalogs and whatever to call this chalk. Mm -hmm. It isn't chalk. It's China clay. And there's all this stuff about if you want to see if you have a chalky one, you have to streak it with a silver chip and everything, which then ruins the stamp because you can't get that off. But uh, if you just simply know when it started, everything after 1963 uh, pretty much had this on. It's known as an optical brightening agent. It's the same thing that is used in the detergent that's used for clothes. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's a brightening agent is it absorbs energy but reflects in the blue or higher range, which makes your eyes think things are whiter than they are. So the truth is, we probably all actually look like hell in here, but it looks pretty good. So, yeah. So guess what? The radiation given off by the paper coating now interferes with the phosphorescence that is being developed. So many of the stamps ended up having a varnish under them to help quench or enhance one or the other of these signals coming out here so the machines could read it. So at this point, by 1963, you've got a lot of stuff here to collect. And this is where both the Wilding series, and I think the Wilding stamps are just beautiful, and the Machins to come with different coatings, the OCP, the original coated paper with this OBA on it, was anything from completely dull to put your sunglasses on. Mm -hmm. A fluorescent coated paper then came along and Part of my confusion in collecting the Machins in the beginning, if you go through the Degum catalog, mm -hmm. is you keep jumping from paper to paper. And you sit there wondering, why in the world is this happening? And you end up having to go back and understand the problems with the interface to not only the sorting equipment, but also to dispensing equipment. It turned out the coil machines were designed to work with the stiffness that gum Arabic provides. But when polyvinyl alcohol was adopted in the early 60s, suddenly all the coils started jamming up. And the original dispensers of the booklets, if you didn't have trimmed perforations on the side, they would jam up. So there was a whole period in the machines where you have imperforate on the side for booklets. So again, another whole collection of definable different stamps. Okay, so the Machin comes along now, and it's the inheritor of all of this development that has gone on. The only real difference, I think, to begin with is the paper from henceforth is unwatermarked. So they, they, they did away with, mm -hmm. with that. It's a real simple stamp. It's just a picture of the queen, and it comes from an image that Arnold Machin produced, and he created a bas relief, which he carved the image into a flat surface. And then a plaster cast was made from that. Uh, actually, three plaster casts initially were delivered to Royal Mail. He had previously done coinage for the UK, which is what this image is right here. So if you look at a lot of UK coins, Canada, other places, you see this image. So it's the Queen. She has this headpiece on, and Arnold Machen, 1911 to 1999, he was a brilliant guy, and he was selected over a number of other people, Restall and, and others, because they wanted a three-dimensional effect on the stamp, and they thought that doing this from an actual plaster cast with the photography to build the thing would work, which it did. The image has some differences in it depending on how the light was set on the plaster cast when they started doing the multi-step photography. There were three casts delivered. Royal Mail immediately dropped one of them and shattered it. One was painted with a dark background, or the background being here, and the other was left light because they were going to have stamps that were both dark and light that enhanced the ability to print the ink. There are 17 defined heads, and this all comes from the light setting and the step and repeat camera. 
and they are fully defined by the modern British philatelic circle, heads A through H, I believe. And there are lots of defining characteristics, but some of the big ones are the bottom down here, the way the pearls are set, this little piece of hair right here, and how this comes out. And by the way, this is not a crown. This is a diadem, and it was the same diadem used on the penny black. This was taken from an image that Machen insisted was his photography. He did take photographs of the queen. I have his original letters claiming that it was his image used. But once he died, a fellow named Hedgeco came along and said, well, I took images of the queen and Machen used my image. And this is the Hedgeco image. Royal Mail amazingly ruled in favor of Hedgeco. And I have first day covers of the Machens signed by Hedgeco. So anyway, the head is quite important in this. You can see... This is the double head printing that Royal Mail did from time to time. It's exactly the same uh, diadem up here. So the colors, this is the pre-decimal release. You can see two of them here that look the same. The images uh, ended up running into a lot of trouble. This was the letter rate at the time uh, for denarius. And the problem was that it was very often used for mail-in betting. Well, you have to be able to see the time stamp on the letter to know if it was valid. You couldn't see it because the stamp is black and the ink was black. So you ended up getting a vermilion. The eight up here was originally scarlet and it became duck egg blue. Cambridge trials. So these stamps get released and there are lots and lots of complaints within the post office. First of all, the letter sorters, the people who do things by hand, got very confused by all the colors, didn't know what was what. There was complaints that the darker colors, in fact, were problematic in the sorting machines and that the dark color interfered with the signal being given off by the paper brightener and the phosphorescence. So mm -hmm. without Machen's knowledge, the Royal Mail went to Cambridge University and said, you've got to do a trial for us. And they produced quite a number of these. I think it was in the 90s of every shade you can imagine. They went through all kinds of trials with people test sorting and things like that by hand. And they finally came up and concluded, I'm sorry, there's no palette that we can come up with for the number of colors that you have, which are driven by the number of values, which can work successfully with all the equipment and doesn't confuse the people. So they threw up their hands. Machen, and I have the whole document of this from the archives at home, Machen went berserk when he found this out because this was his stamp and his colors were his colors. And he wrote a seriously acid letter to a uh, post office about all this. Finally, they arrived at this as a color palette up here. Eventually, they needed more colors and uh, they brought in a fellow named Jeffrey Matthews, who was an artistic designer. And he came up with this color palette. There have since been other colors that have been added to this, but it is one of the really attractive elements of collecting a machin. And it's a candy store. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't care about anything else, you know, they look really great on a page. <laughs> so then, because you needed a cylinder to put the vans on, and the cylinders were moderately expensive, they decided. Uh, let's go with uh, phosphor-coated paper. This took quite a long development because the phosphorescent materials are not amenable to water or water vapor, but the paper-making process is water-intensive. And so various phosphorescent compounds were finally produced, and you could get phosphor all over the paper. Well, this counts as a first-class stamp. So for second-class stamps, you can't use this you have to go back to bands. Plus, this was yet another compound put on which environmentalists would ultimately complain about. And so after starting this development in the 1950s, they all ended up back exactly where they were with non-coated paper and with phosphorescent bands. There were multiple printers here. 
Enschede, a Dutch printer, De La Rue, in business for a long time, Waddington, Cuesta, Walsall is also a printer in here. This is Corvassier out of Switzerland. But if you collect these things and you, you have any of the salvage, you end up noticing on the Harrison over here, and Harrison's was in business from 1531 to the 1980s. There's a rabbit. And so you sit there and wonder, you know, why there a rabbit if you look at this sort of stuff? And the reason is from 1557, Harrison, the printer, used what was called a rebus, which was popular back then, which was a picture that sort of spelled out your name. So you have a hare, a rabbit down here. You have a sheaf of rye and the sun, hare rye sun. That's why there's a rabbit over here on the Harrison oh. sandwich. So the castles continue. Again, uh, hugely collectible, high value pieces. The no value indicated printings come on. And they came on not because of inflation, which was high, but because they started selling stamps through retail outlets rather than just the post office. And the deal was prior to that, that any unused stamps at the post office went back for destruction back to the printer. Now with all of these restaurants, hotels, whatever, filling stations, they couldn't do that anymore. So they had to do something about not having to issue new denominations each time. And so they came up with first and second. So it would just be first or second class whenever it was used. This is the key then to the resurgence of the modern day counting fitting of this stamp, which is huge because now the counterfeiters don't have to worry about the denomination anymore. All they need to do is print some reasonable facsimile, take it to a small grocery store or filling station to resell. They had also been very concerned about reuse of stamps. And this goes all the way back to the penny black again, because the penny black initially was printed with a permanent ink and the red cancel was fugitive ink. They later switched in the penny black to the black being a fugitive ink and eventually the whole thing, cancellation, everything being doubly fugitive, meaning uh, water and oil-based solvents just dissolve everything on there. So it's obvious that it has been pulled out. Their solution here was to add die cut ovals to this, such that if you try to peel the stamp off or soak it off, these tear out, and then it's obvious that it, it's been taken out, even if you can get the uh, cancellation out. This harkens back to the grills and U.S. stamps in the 1800s. So the counterfeiters and the and Royal Mail get into a, a weapons race. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't expect you to read this, but these are all the steps that were taken by Royal Mail to try and make it more and more and more complicated to reproduce this stamp. Here's a real stamp. This is a, a fake stamp, which has the overprinting back here that says Royal Mail. It looks wonderful. The image is great. It's a very advanced lithography versus gravier, which today is digital gravier. And they finally threw up their hands and said, okay, we're going to try something different. This is how the Machen looks today. This is not a separate piece over here. It looks like it is, but that's just a colored line that simulates the uh, die cut perforations here. Every single stamp has a unique 2D barcode to attempt to record this as it's used such that that barcode can never be reused. They still actually have the ovals on them down here, like having double insurance, I guess, and this is how they look. However, the counterfeiters don't give a rip about that. They simply copied off a pane oh. of, of these. They're going to take it back to the same filling station. They don't know. Obviously, they, they don't know if this is you know, good or not. And back to selling uh, stacks of, of 100 of these. It's unclear how well this is going to work. And if you think about this, of the technology in this, it's actually pretty amazing and I think perhaps optimistic. To print this at the speed that these run, you have to have an inkjet that can source a different 2D barcode 
down here for every single stamp across the web. And then as you're reading this, if you've ever seen the speed at which optical character reading machines work, they're just flying through. They have to read this and make a decision to reject it or not. So, so if it finds a duplicate, what, what happens? The uh, processing equipment scans that barcode and finds it's a duplicate. Yeah. What do they do? It rejects the envelope and it goes back saying uh, postage not paid or postage due or whatever that bill market has. Even if the sender was ignorant, not knowing they use uh, counterfeits, they're the ones getting penalized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. There's a lot of other information in here, too. And it's sort of a summary of this. You've got quite a range of the images of the queen. And of course, morning stamps were issued as a farewell to her last year. And of course, King Charles has now taken over. So as a final piece of this, I wonder what the plaster cast looked like. It looks like this. When Machen's estate was dissolved in 2000, 2001, there were two of these that were found there. One is at the Royal Philatelic Society today under glass. The other is still owned by whoever purchased it at auction. But Machen in 1976, with the permission of the post office, produced a limited number of these for sale through Royal China, a British producer of China. The only differences are he had to make a couple of differences so that in the thinking back then, this couldn't be photographed and reproduced. I've only ever seen two of these at auction since 1976. Fired ceramic? It may be plaster. I don't know. So, given to me this year by a British collector, Tony Walker. So, with that, thank you very much for your attention. So, in your many layers of variations, cliche variants, this was not one of them. Were they so consistent by the 60s that you could look at under stamps in a sheet and not see any variations? In, in the image or in, in the uh, value tablet? In the image. I mean, like older stamps, you know, there would be a lot of plate variations because they used the, the methods they yes. used. Yes, um, there are some. And it, it comes down to the catalogs. Gibbons catalog, for example, lists flaws. The connoisseur catalog lists shades and variations and the Degum catalog lists exactly where the value tablet appears. Well, exactly. I mean, a huge listing of these, but you can find the stuff moving uh, moving around. It's not so much age. It has to do with the step and repeat camera right. that picked up slightly different positions of images. Right. Yeah, but I didn't even count those in the 7,000 varieties. Right. I mean, it's... It's wild. In your APS article this fall, you said there were 170 of the one and a half alone. Yeah. Was that taking all these variations into consideration? Yeah. 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 Well, without the tablet variations. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of them and and the half P, they're all turquoise, you know. So if you decide to collect that, you end up, unless you add images and descriptions with five dozen stamps that all look exactly the same <laughs> to the naked eye. So it becomes a challenge then of, of how do you actually collect these? And most people that get into it, make their own pages. And you have to decide at what level, because there's no way you, you can't find a dealer that has all mm-hmm. of that. Yes, Steve. What's the, uh, the two dimensional barcodes? Yeah. Uh, what's the, uh, what exactly does it read? I mean, how does it read? Is it like an 18-digit number, or how does it have? Uh... Well, it's like reading a Q code. You know, you have a, a camera that sees it and interprets the image. Now, in that 2D barcode, there is the, the, the date of production and other information that has to do with which printer it came from. Today, they're all at Walsall, but it's provision in there for that. So if it goes through and it, it sees this image and it knows today's date, it can take that information. It's, it's got to be a serial number of some kind. Take it up into a computer 
and save it. And then if it sees it again, it knows that it's because this number has already been used. How many possible numbers are there? Millions. So well, millions. That's more than that. Trillions. 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 Yeah. In the millions, right? So it's, it, it is staggering to think about this. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it is believed that this image is the most reproduced image in history. And if you think about that and the number of stamps that that implies, it's a big number. I don't know what it is. And I don't see how a computer can possibly work as fast as it needs to to keep up with the optical character recognition systems. Do all the nations have the 2D barcode? Yes. All the variety, the different denominations? All the new ones after 2022. Yeah. Okay. But King Charles and everything else in the UK now has that, has that. and they've demonetized everything that doesn't have a barcode. Right? Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's staggering, and I'd be amazed if it really, really works. Yeah. But one thing that's happening is that there is a huge decrease in terms of using these things. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Well, so, true. well, true. So you finally solved the problem just when you don't get yeah. it. Yeah. So I'm a complete novice in this, but Norway copied a lot of British technology, paper types for phosphorescence. The King Harold series of the 1990s, there are many stamps. You can't distinguish paper types unless they're still mint. Is that the case with Machens? Uh, it, it, it is. And the way that I have gotten around that in my exhibit is the only thing I show is a source piece. It's either a... A, a booklet pane or a cylinder block or a coil mm-hmm. such as mm-hmm. which in fact are all cataloged by paper and mm-hmm. all these other things. So showing that it's it was from cylinder six with other characteristics about it, I can clearly identify that it has this paper, it came from this printer, you know, and so forth. Right. But if you have just a pile of them, you can only get so far. There is a system within the Degum catalog that you can take a pile of machins and you can actually identify it very, very closely to, to exactly when it was printed from where and whatever. And, and in the seminar that I put on at the APS, we go through that for a day. It drives everybody nuts. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the time. That's fascinating. Excellent.